geochronology with this little mini lecture number three. Last one, the main points, was that we had this radioactive decay and ingrowth from of parent and daughter, right? And it relates to half-lives. We can solve this more numerically using the master equation of geochronology, which is d equals d naught plus parent times e to the lambda t minus one. That is the equation. We can measure each of those variables, and sometimes we have to make this really important assumption. So what I want to do in this last lecture is we're going to jump to Roman numeral four, and we are going to explore the whole process in detail using this uranium lead decay system. This is going to be our example. We could have chosen, chosen, excuse me, a lot of other different types of decay. There is carbon dating, you've heard of that, there's rubidium strontium, there's argon argon, there's potassium argon, samarium neodymium, but let's just focus on uranium lead for this lecture. Uranium lead's pretty cool because there's actually two different decay schemes that we can use. Now, 99% of all uranium lead decay takes the form of uranium-238. 238. 238. This is how we can show uranium-238, which has an atomic number of 92, which decays to lead-206, PB-206 which has 82. The half-life for this is 4.4 billion years. I think we can get more specific than that. Now, there's another decay scheme that occurs with uranium that might be occurring in zircon, and that is when you have uranium-235 that also decays through a series of steps to lead-207. The half-life for this is a little faster. It is around 704 million years. All right, so actually both of these are ongoing, and that's one of the best utilities, is because what uranium lead decay does is we can get an age with this major decay scheme, and then we can get a, another age, basically at the exact same time, using this decay scheme, and they better equal one another. They have this internal test within themselves. So as we look at this, let's just take a look at this example. Uranium-235 decaying to lead-207. Look at how much the mass changes and how much the atomic number changes. What does this loss of 10 mass actually mean? Well, it means that there's this comple complex decay step that occurs. And I'm going to write the entire one down here. It's going to take um, a minute or two to go through this, but I think it illustrates the process for you and it's worth the time. So what we do is before any decay starts, we have uranium-235. Uranium-235 decays to thorium-231. What type of decay is that? Look at that. It's a mass drop of four, so that must be an alpha decay, right? One of those heliums. Well, uranium-231 is not stable and it decays via beta decay to proactinium. What's the symbol for proactinium? 230 to 231. Notice the mass stays the same because it's just beta decay. Well, the proactinium goes to actinium 227. What type of decay? It's alpha again because it's a drop of four, which then goes through a beta decay. We can guess that the mass is going to be the same then, right? Which is 227 thorium. There's thorium again, but notice it's a different isotope of thorium than the first time. Thorium-231 goes to francium-223, right? That's got to be alpha. Francium goes to radon-223. Uh-oh, that's radium. My bad. That's radium. So we got to got to put the right symbol here. That's RA-223. Radium goes to astentine there's one you probably haven't said too many times. I know I haven't. And the symbol for that one, you'd have to be a real chemistry nerd to know that it is AT. Well, this 219 AT goes through decay to actual radon. So here we go. Radon, different symbol. It's 219. So this is a beta. This is an alpha. What's this one? I forgot to put it in. That one's got to be a beta because the mass stays the same. Radon goes through alpha decay to bismuth. 
If it's alpha decay, what's the mass? 215. That's right, it has to drop by 4. Bismuth goes to polonium. Now, you don't have to memorize this, right? I'm not trying to overwhelm you with the memorization. I'm just trying to demonstrate. Let's see, this is a beta decay. I'm trying to demonstrate that this is actually a complex decay scheme. And if that's all you learn from this whole exercise, it's fine. We're doing it right. This goes to AT. Ah, it's the same AT, so it's, but it's a different isotope this time. This is going to be AT215. AT215 will decay to lead 211 through an alpha decay. But wait, we're not heading towards lead 211. We're trying to get to lead 207. So this lead is actually a radioactive byproduct, and it needs to decay. Oh, I didn't understand my notes. That's not lead. That's supposed to be PO, polonium. No, no, no. Oh my gosh. All I'm doing is confusing everyone now. As you can see, this is a complex scheme for me as well. That's fine. I will show my mistake to you. This is 211 PB. 211 PB turns into 211 bismuth, which will turn into 211 P. O, which will then turn into 207 thallium. Oop, that's not a, that's an L. That's an L for thallium, which then finally gets us to where we need to be. Oh my gosh, this took us a long time. 207 lead. That is the decay scheme that occurs. Many different alpha and beta steps. Now, in practice, for uranium lead decay, we do not measure just set amounts of uranium and set amounts of lead. What we end up usually doing in all of geochronology, and we're going to write this here, in practice, the mass spectrometers we use measure ratios. The reason why we measure ratios is because mass spectrometers end up being more sensitive to um, ratios than they are to just measuring single elements. But then it also provides a really nice way to solve the geochronology equation. Because the master equation of geochronology, remember, was d equals d naught plus n times e to the lambda t minus 1. But what we can do is we can rearrange this so we end up having d over n equals e to the lambda t minus 1. That's a rearrangement where we've taken out d naught because we've assumed it to be zero, so we kind of get rid of it, right? And then what we have here on the left side of the equation is a ratio. So what this would look like in geochronology, in lead geochronology, is we would measure the lead 206 ratio to uranium 238. And then we could set that equal to e to the lambda this type of lambda is the 238 minus 1. Let's see. That rid of that. Let's see. There's our equation. And, and then at the same time, in the same exact zircon crystal, we could also measure the ratio of lead 207 to uranium 235. And we set that equal to lambda T235. So, oh man, why am I making all these mistakes? You know, I do have the opportunity to use an eraser. I can come in here and I can go, ah, let's get rid of that and do that correctly since I don't want to have mistakes taught to my students. E to the lambda 235 T minus 1. Right? In each case, of course, we're really trying to solve for T. The decay schemes are known from physics. And then all we're needing to do is measure these ratios on the mass spectrometer. And if we can do them at the same time, then we can get an age from two decay schemes at once. And this is exciting for us geologists. This is called a concordant age using a Concordia diagram. It might be simpler for me just to draw the Concordia diagram first and then kind of unpack it as it's already drawn here for you. But in short, what we're going to do is since we have two decays, 
two decay schemes, then we can get two solutions. And the idea here is they must um, give same answer. So let me get, create some space for myself. Here we go. Let's draw the Concordia diagram. That is not a straight line. Do better in your notes, okay? Oh my gosh. All right, so the x-axis is going to be the ratio of 207 lead to 235 uranium. And the y-axis is the 206 lead to 238 uranium. And we can get some age or some number here, and we can get some number here. And those things, if they give you the same number, they're a dot. And what we found is that answers that are the same should plot along this curved line. And where they plot is the age. So here would be like 4 billion years. Here's 3 billion years. Here's 2 billion years. Here's 1 billion years years. And so when we have a dot or a, a, a measurement from a mass spectrometer that plots on the line, that is called a concordant age. We have had two decay schemes that give the same answer. And so let's say that this case, it was 2.3 billion years old. And we would feel really good about that as an answer. There's a lot of other decay schemes out there one of which is called rubidium strontium and it works in a slightly different way let's see if we have enough time to get into it oh i forgot to set the timer so i guess we do come on page start a new page here's what we'll do since um i've lost track of time entirely we're going to just briefly go through how rubidium strontium works to finish geochronology so roman numeral five rubidium decays to strontium. And our decay scheme here, we have 87 rubidium and it as atomic number 37 and it decays with a beta decay to 87 strontium. And it has that atomic number. Now the big problem with this scheme is that strontium, the daughter, occurs in minerals. So we're going to introduce a problem is that strontium occurs occurs in minerals. And so we cannot say dot or not equals zero. No, we cannot say that in this case. What ends up happening is that strontium follows calcium. So in minerals, what minerals have a lot of calcium? Things like feldspars micas, amphiboles, there's a lot of different minerals that have a lot of calcium. And then the other thing here is that rubidium follows potassium, which can also occur in a lot of minerals. Well, what geochronologists have done is they've come up with this really clever solution, and that is we can just ratio things to a stable isotope. So hang with me here. So we're going to say C is our clever solution. Come on, solution. And our clever solution is that 86 strontium is a stable isotope. Nothing decays to it. And so what we can do is we can measure, we can we can measure, we can divide each part of the master equation of geochronology by 86 strontium to create a new equation. And so here is the master equation for strontium. We would measure 87 strontium over 86 strontium now. All right? That'd be like the daughter. And that equals 87 strontium over 86 strontium at time zero. All right? Daughter initial plus 87 bidium over 86 strontium now times e to the lambda t minus 1. That would be this new equation. 
And what ends up happening is that this right here creates a flat line on something called an isochron plot. And so we're going to go here. We're going to go. This is how we're finishing class today. We're going to finish class with an isochron plot. And the way the isochron plot works is, all right, we're going to draw, draw really straight lines. All right. Fail. Uh, better. The x-axis of an isochron plot is the ratio of 87 rubidium to 86 strontium. And the y-axis is 87 strontium to 86 strontium. And so let's think about these axes real quick. 87 is strontium is our ingrowth. So when we go higher in this direction on this graph, this is our ingrowth direction. But different minerals have different amounts of 87 rubidium to start with. So what will end up happening is that at time equals zero, we're going to put a dashed line. There's going to be minerals that would plot right here at time zero, here at time zero, and here at time zero, because they have different amount of potassium and thus different amounts of rubidium. So we would say that this is a low rubidium mineral. This would be a moderate rubidium mineral. This would be a high rubidium mineral. That's at time zero. Now what we need to think about is how does ingrowth occur as time progresses? Well as time progresses the high rubidium is going to lose rubidium and make strontium making a line that goes in this direction. This one will produce less strontium because it had less rubidium to start and then this one had almost no rubidium would have a little tiny line and that creates a new line and this would be the line at time equals one okay and this line so this is called the isochron at time equals one as you have more time progress then high minerals decay a lot more than low minerals and so you get a little tiny arrow real big arrow, middle size arrow, and so we'd have this, time equals two. And so as rocks get older and older, they plot further and further in this direction, okay? And so the slope on this line is the age of the rock. And we'll just put that right here, slope of isochron provides age. I think we have an example that we could show of this. Let's see, where is my isochron plot? Here it is. Here's a real life example from a scientist named Leon Long working on a pluton from Brazil. And so we have these minerals down here that are very low, right? Our low strontium, or sorry, our low rubidium minerals. We have our moderate rubidium minerals. We have our high rubidium minerals. There's a slope that gets produced, and the slope of that line gives you an age of a rock. All right, that's it for me and geochronology. If there were things that were unclear to you, go take a look at that textbook or reach out to me with an email.